Welcome to Investor's Guide. We have a different episode planned out for you this week. I'm with Parag Pari, a maverick investor, a value investor, someone who's been tracking our market for decades, and of course, the chairman of Parag Pari Financial Advisory Services. Parag, thank you so much for joining us on the show. I'm particularly glad that we, we're talking at a time like this, when investors are thinking about coming back into the market. And why wouldn't they? Because we've had analysts predict that we're at the beginning of what might be India's largest ever bull run. Now, as someone who's been watching this market for decades and who's been swimming against the tide, first tell me if you agree that we're at the beginning of the biggest bull run ever? Yeah, uh, we are definitely at the beginning of good times. We've got a leadership where people have put their faith in it and that's why Mr. Narendra Modi has become the Prime Minister. Uh, there's a lot of hope in it, but you have to also see that he has inherited an economy which is quite in shambles decision making has stopped. So expecting him to have a magic wand is expecting too much. So we will have a bright future, but no bright future comes without a pain. And I think we will have to go through the pains and give our leader the chance to make a better tomorrow for all of us. Well, if you look at the market right now, and you're right in the sense that the fundamentals haven't changed, it's largely sentiment at this point. So. How should we as retail investors be reading this market? Is it only sentiment? Is it time to get in? Is it going to run up further? What would you advise us to do? See, first is I would ask the retail investors, ask yourself whether you are an investor or a punter who has just entered because the markets are good. Had the retail investor been a good long-term investor, he would have bought it last year. When stocks were available very cheap, nobody was buying. But today, because the sentiment has changed, everyone wants to come in here to make a fast buck. So if the retail investor is trying to do that, that you are going to be paying excessive money for the stocks you buy. So it's not that values will not be available, but just getting into the market because everyone is getting in, just because of the herd mentality, then you are bound to be a loser. Secondly, as an investor, as a retail investor, you have to consider that investing is a game of patience. It's you have to follow the law of the farm. You cannot sow something today and reap tomorrow. A seed which has been sown has to go through different seasons over a period of time before it turns into a fully grown tree. Similar is the case with investments. So if retail investors are thinking just get in and just make some good money, it's not going to happen. So tell me for somebody who's looking at getting into the market right now, what is the best way to approach this market? See, I'll tell you first is uh, go through a mutual fund route and go through your SIPs. So that way you are actually going through the good times as well as bad times because there is a concentrated effort to be in the markets. And uh, a good fund manager can over a period of time give you good returns. So my advice to them would be that instead of just going and buying the next hot stock in the market. But well, the other interesting thing that's happening right now is that a lot of the sectors that were shunned by the market over the last three years have come back into the spotlight and investors are writing in, uh, sending us emails asking if it's time to invest in real estate, time to invest in infrastructure. How important is it for them to be careful when they're considering these themes? You have to be really careful because first is <clears throat> there's something like a value in use and a value in exchange. Value in use is something like water, that we all require water. If we don't get water, we can die. Value in exchange is a diamond, that anybody will be able to give you a lot of money if you own a piece of diamond, and nobody will give you money for water. So if you are really looking at that, then power is a sector, which is definitely India is power deficit, power is required for everyone, it's a new growth area, but it's a value in use. I doubt whether any company, power company will be able to charge phenomenal rates for the power we use. Tomorrow there'll be riots. Mm -hmm. So people get excited about something which is a value in use and I think that's where they would burn their fingers. Infrastructure, long-term projects, heavily into debts. When the profits come in, they'll be first shared by, taken by the creditors by way of interest. So it's not a great business 
where just now because there is a fancy people will make money. We saw the same type of boom in 2007-8. What happened? People lost money. So, we come to the most important part is, when you chase a fancy, you pay a fancy price. And soon that fancy will end. And you have a fancy loss. I think investors need to understand this, rather than just blindly going into what is hot in the market. Explain value investing to me right now. It's, it's a concept that you have always used. It's a concept that your particular mutual fund is using as well. And I'm sure it's an idea that a lot of our viewers will benefit from. Explain to us how to use value investing in this market. See, value investing is very simple. You buy something which is neglected. You buy something which is not available. And when we are practicing value investing, first we start with a business which is owned by a credible management business which has a strong moat around it by way of uh, distribution network, patents, uh, brands, businesses which require least amount of capital, which require less amount of debt and above all it has to have a good pricing power. And if that is available at a good valuation, you think it is value investing. And that is why you have to buy stocks when you don't feel like buying. The problem with all the retail investors is they buy stocks when they feel like buying. Now it is typical of the psychology of investors is they find a stock very risky when nobody is buying and when the prices are low. And they find it least risky when everyone is buying and the prices are going up. Value investing is just doing the opposite of that in simple terms. All right, so we're talking about investing our hard and money. When we come back from this very quick break, we'll talk about Parag's own mutual fund and we'll understand the concepts that go behind making that fund work. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching Investor's Guide and ET now. Thank you for staying with us. Mr. Parag Parekh is with us as well. We're talking about investing in this market. Parag, I want to talk about your own mutual fund. Unlike a lot of other AMCs, you only have one fund. One scheme. One scheme. Tell us why you only have one scheme. When you launch a mutual fund, what is important is your fund manager is able to take every investment opportunity that comes in the market. So you devise your scheme in such a way that your fund manager is given all leeway to participate into every investment opportunity in the market. That was what our idea was that we don't want to have a supermarket. We wanted to invest money for people, give them the right returns. For us, this is a profession. And for those who have multiple schemes, it has become a business. And that's why ma uh, marketing has taken over stewardship. We have kept our mutual fund as because we believe we are stewards of the money which is interested to us. If I understand correctly, you and your, all of your employees have also invested in the same fund? Yes, definitely, because I can't ask you to invest if I myself don't invest. It is because we believe in what we are doing. And uh, I think that is one of the finest points that not only myself, my directors, my fund managers, but even my employees. Because today when you are managing money, you have to have a vision where you want to go. So you have to be focused and Investors need to understand what you really stand for. That's why even on our form, in red colors we write that anybody having an investment horizon less than five years, this fund is not for you. It's, it's very interesting because in the beginning you also said something to the effect of if you feel the market has run up too high, you will stop taking investments into this fund because you believe that, that there will be no value to be offered for your investor. Tell us a little bit more about that. Tell us you know, when you expect or if at all you expect the market to hit those points. Uh, it can happen anytime, but the idea of this is that most of the time investors are greedy when the markets are going up and values are not available. So what we are talking about is just common sense that if you are managing money for people, they think it's your job to educate them that don't put money just now. And for that the painful part for you to do is they don't accept the money. 
you don't have a investor education seminar over there and then do something opposite see today your actions have to be in tune with what you talk about so i think we are just aligning our basic values by our actions tell me this you also using what you call behavioral finance to manage the money in this scheme tell us how you use behavioral finance and what it is it's don't follow the herd so when everyone is going that way do you have the courage to be away from that herd secondly uh, they saying our scheme only one scheme no more schemes any <coughs> value investing telling the clients that okay less than 5 years loan come you can't be everything to everyone mm -hmm. and behavioral finance is about that that what do you want to stand for see we have to stand for something in life so you stand for this and whom do we want we don't want every tom dick and harry we want all those people who believe in our long term investment philosophy you come to us i also want to talk to you about the cost of the plan right now for of your scheme there is there is a view that it is a little bit on the expensive side even the direct plan is uh charges about 2.26% if i'm not mistaken do you believe isn't that a little expensive then for you know competing against other mutual funds that might be i'm telling you first is you have to understand ppf is long term value fund we don't have any competition we have no competitors we are not in the race from uh, assets under management they all are under the race for assets under management they have multiple schemes we have only one scheme they have uh, a big sales team we don't have a sales team we are into value investing they are on to the, they are there to contribute to every fad or fancy of the market now i don't have any research. that's why i'm not even concerned with it and secondly <clears throat> as far as your uh, uh, fee structure is concerned you have to see ultimately over a period of time what we have contributed to the investors wealth rather than calculating fees now today if you fall sick are you going to go to a quack doctor or going to go, uh, go to the best you're going to pay him more because that's where the value lies so if people believe that we have value they'll come to us you also have the ability to invest internationally within this one scheme tell us how important it is for all retail investors right now to consider an international allocation investing is all about preservation of capital and a reasonable rate of return that's the most important thing and we have kept that in mind and have a geographical distribution that there are certain innovative companies which are available in the international markets which are not available over here in the pharmaceuticals in the technology and uh, why should our investors not get benefit of that just now as an investor you can definitely invest into international stocks but there are certain limits and it is too tedious for them to do that and so we want to have a balanced funds of equity without losing the tax benefits which an equity fund get we are enabling the investors to go see today the most important we have really worked on our scheme how do we want the scheme what is the right type of scheme which will benefit the investors and with our competitors is the marketing guys who make the schemes that's the difference there's a major difference we'll take a very quick break but if you have a question for parag right to us our email id is at the bottom of your screen you can also tweet in a question if you'd like to on the other side we'll talk about using mutual funds to plan for our children for our retirement and for our futures don't go anywhere Welcome back you're watching Investors Guide in ET now. Thank you for staying with us. Parag Parekh is with us as well. Parag, thank you for staying with us. We were talking about your own value long-term value fund before we went into the break. Uh the interesting thing about that fund is that it's the only one in the market without a dividend option. Tell us why you don't have a dividend option on the fund, on the scheme. Because I think it's the most stupidest thing to do. Because today if your mutual fund NAV is 15 rupees I give you one rupee by way of dividend. Tomorrow, the NAV will go down to fourteen rupees, and when that money comes into your hand, this thing you are bound to consider in your mental account as free money, and you are bound to splurge it. But what we have we uh, have trained our clients is that you decide the dividend you want. You want a dividend every year, redeem that much amount of shares. because every time when you give dividend it's considered as free secondly <clears throat> the cost involved in distribution of a dividend we take care of that it's not involved you want a dividend for yourself i may give you a dividend of 20000 rupees on your stock 
you want only 5000, your 15000 is invested back, you only redeem what you want. I think that was the reason that we, uh, this thing we did not come out with a dividend. And secondly, what is the dividend, giving your own money back, is it dividend? So, you did say a little earlier that you would like only those who have a 5 year horizon. Obviously, long term investors who are building or accumulating wealth. Mm. So, not someone for example who needs a regular income coming out of their investment. So, a lot of times when an investor writes to us, they write in saying that I want to plan for my child, I want to plan for my future, I want to buy a house after 10 years. Tell us how important it is to have a goal when we approach an investment and not just buy a mutual fund because it sounds interesting at the time. It depends because it depends upon what age you are starting investing, what are your goals in your investing and uh, what is your ability to go to the ups and downs of the market, you know. Now today with your inflation ranging between 12 to 13 percent, the real inflation and your interest rates being much lower than that, the fact that you put money into fixed deposit or anything, you already started making a loss. Suppose if you had a 1 crore deposit 10 years back, 10 years back you could buy at least a 1 bedroom apartment in a suburb with a 1 crore rupees. Now you were always thinking my money is safe, you are looking at the return of your money, you are not looking at return on your money nor are you looking at inflation uh, taking down the purchasing power. Now 10 years back a fixed deposit of 1 crore, today if you get that 1 crore what will it buy? I think investors, retail investors should be really looking at that. Secondly, why stocks are the best form of investment? This is because when you are buying a business, stocks is buying a business which I told you in the beginning of my interview, is you are buying a business which sells a service or a product at a profit and that profit is a little bit of it is distributed to you by way of dividends and the rest is ploughed back into the company. The business owns land, machinery, real estate, uh, uh, plants, knowledge workers, patents, everything it owns and it grows. Once it grows, it has a pricing power because in inflation situations, it is uh, it's also able to increase its prices. That is why if you really see the way equities have returned from inception, and equities have returned about 18 percent per annum compounding. Now that is a phenomenal compounding growth rate. So I would say the retail investors, if you are young, 24, 25, 26, 30, I do not think that you got to be putting all into equities rather than getting scared and just putting into debt and all because you are eroding your money. As far as real estate it concern, uh, is concerned, what are your goals? Do you have your own house? Where are you staying? It would depend upon individually and everyone wants a uh, roof over the, their head. So, the real estate would depend upon individual choices. What about more than one house? We know that there are viewers who like to buy a second house as an investment, give it out on rent. Is that a concept that you are heard of? Uh, what are the rentals today? About 2 to 3 percent. And what are they saying? Alternatively, uh, they are saying if you put that money, even in fixed deposits, I would tell you, it is about 8 to 9 percent. You are making a loss over there. So, rentals is. Secondly, when should you consider a house, they are saying as an investment or an asset, when you are fully paid for it. So, people taking a loan and thinking that they have bought an asset, they, say, <coughs> they have bought a liability because till they do not pay off to the bank, meaning the house is not there. Only the banker will come and tell you he is helping you to buy an asset, but you are buying a liability. That is why even if you have a house with your own money which you have bought, which is all paid off and you keep it locked and you pay the society's charges, then also you should consider it as a liability. One asset class we must talk about and although it has had a fairly rough run over the last one year or so is gold. Mm -hmm. And irrespective of what a lot of investment managers or advisors say, Indians love to buy gold. What is your advice right now for someone watching at home who still prefers to buy a little gold every year and lock it up? You just mentioned that it is Indians who want to buy gold. So it is not a decision which is coming from the mind, it is coming from the heart. And when a decision comes from the heart, they think there are no arguments towards it. Uh, I also want some advice for our retired viewers right now. What we talked about so far was for young people 20, 30, 40, you said 50 as well. 
what if I'm retired, I have a kitty of money that I'd like to protect, I also need to beat inflation through the course of my retired life, what is the best way to approach asset allocation in that case? It would depend upon the risk, uh, the risk uh, bearing ability of that person, but still I would say that the way inflation is going to your hedge against inflation, equities have to be a part of your portfolio. How much would depend upon what that person's risk capability is there. We have a couple of questions on Twitter for you. Manoj Kumar Garg has written in. He says he would like to invest 10 lakh rupees for the long term, which is a good thing. But he also says everyone is talking about the fact that the Sensex will now cross 1 lakh. So if I invest 1 crore rupees, it may become 4 crore rupees. Do you agree? First is people are trying to sell you dreams. So don't be sold on those, on those dreams. Even in this market, if you get 12 to 15 percent over a long period compounding, that's phenomenal returns. And uh, it's only your type of people who get, uh, who really get trapped when outsiders are trying to sell you stories. Another thing you understand that financial markets are the markets with the least amount of integrity. The only ruling ethos is how do I get money from the other guy's pocket. So you have to be careful and don't allow others to exploit your greed. Anyone investing in a mutual fund right now, 12-15% annualized is really phenomenal returns. Is it unfair to expect more than that? No, I think it's more than fair. And if anybody can do this consistently, who can do this consistently? Only long term, if you are invested for the long term. We have a question from Jigar who writes in on Twitter. He says, please ask Paragu, which of the sectors should he invest in within mid caps? and which are the best stocks within that sector. So he's obviously another investor who's getting carried away with the theme. What do you have to say to him? Any sector which is neglected today, which you don't hear about it in all your TV shows or in the, your newspapers, I think those, those sectors would definitely have value. So whatever you are hearing today, the hot sectors, I can tell you this thing safely. It's not that they were, those are bad sectors, but when you buy stocks of those sectors, you are paying phenomenally high prices. So you can always wait. And my advice to you is that you have to be greedy when others are fearful and be fearful when others are greedy. Prav, also tell us this, for someone who gets in at this point in the market, like, like the viewers who are writing in to us, what are the risks they are taking? What should they be prepared for? Don't chase the fancies of the market. Don't chase the themes and the stories and the dreams which you are fed by the pe uh, people. IPOs would come just now, uh, new schemes of mutual funds will come just now, depending upon the latest themes, blindly avoid them, you will be much better off. All right. uh, before, we, before we let you go, give us a one investment philosophy, one advice you would like all of our viewers to keep in mind when they are making an investment right now. One is you have to only think long term. And investing and expecting reasonable rate of return is also very important. And don't go by the latest feds and feds in the market. And understand the difference between a stock and a company. You may, buy, may, uh, you may be buying a good company, but it may be a bad stock. Like for instance, in the year 2000 when the technology boom was there, People thought, no, I'll buy a good company like Infosys, Wipro and everything. They were good companies. They were good companies today. But at that point of time, they were bad stocks because they were prohibitively expensive. So just now when times are going up, when you chase fads and fancies, you end up buying bad stocks of even good companies. I think that is the most important thing which they have to realize. All right, we're going to wrap up this interview right here, Parag. Thank you so much Thank for you. spending time with us and answering our questions. If you have a question for Parag, write to us. Email ID is at the bottom of your screen. Thanks so much for watching.